Hi, I'm Dr. Rebecca Hunton, founder of RHMD and creator of The Cure for the Common Medical Practice, where we help you get radiantly healthy. Thanks for listening to this presentation. Today we're here to talk about your poop, or really your results of the tests that I had you take. I know all of you were probably a little taken aback when I said I wanted you to collect your poop and mail it away so we could go over these results. I want to take this opportunity to review with you why I asked you to do it. The gut. Why does it matter so much? Think about all the things it does. It has to be a barrier and keep things out of us that aren't supposed to be in us. It has to digest and break down food products. It also has to assimilate, which means absorb into us that which is desired. It's a very complicated job. When we're born, our digestive tract is sterile. If we're born vaginally, we actually get better bacteria in us than if we go by C-section. Fortunately, today, there's something we can do to help alter that. We're primarily born sterile, but by the time we're an adult, our gut has more bacteria in it than there are cells in us. In fact, there's more DNA in the bacteria in us than there is DNA in our own body. It really begs the question, who's the host and who's the parasite here? If we were to take out our intestine and smooth it out all the nooks and crannies and lay it down flat, it would cover an entire singles tennis court. That's a lot of surface area. We can't talk about the gut without also talking about the gut brain. Did you know there's over a hundred million nerve cells in the human small intestine? That there is many more neurotransmitters in our gut than there are in our brain? And the microbes that live within us interact with a lot of our other systems in our body. So back to the brain. There's a nerve called the vagus nerve that actually communicates with the cells that line the intestine and goes all the way up and talks to the brain. The microbes within us also help stimulate our endocrine cells, making things like leptin, ghrelin, insulin. And the bacteria themselves actually can release neuroactive molecules. And those molecules can feed back to the brain and help us with weight loss and or weight gain. We'll talk more about that later. Along our intestinal tract is something called the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. In fact, 70% of our immune system lines our intestinal tract. So it's no wonder with the interaction between our gut and that many systems that it impacts a lot of things in our body. So anxiety and mood disorders, appetite and satiety, autoimmune and memory are all impacted by whether or not our gut is in balance. A lot of the studies we're doing right now on probiotics in the microbiome involve disease processes we can induce in mice. So we take a mouse and we raise it in a sterile environment and we create a, a human-like disease in it. For example, autism. And we find that if we give that mouse a certain type of bacteria, we can actually reverse a lot of the autistic symptoms. Multiple sclerosis, an autoimmune disease of the neurosystem, we can also induce in mice. And by giving a certain type of probiotic, we can actually reverse this. Very exciting news. About six weeks ago, it was in all the news about is your probiotic the new Prozac? And that's because certain types of bacteria can actually impact mood, especially depression and anxiety. So in summary, our gut is a very complicated organ and the host-flora interaction, meaning us and them, is very complicated. It has 10 times the number of cells as we do, 100 times the genomic material, and it's more metabolically active than the liver. And our brain only weighs three pounds, but it weighs between three and six. We're a little outnumbered here. So how long have we been looking at the microbiome in medicine? This is a s slide which shows 1908 about the history of dysbiosis, which brings up the question, what is intestinal dysbiosis? Dysbiosis means that the bacteria in us are a little out of balance. It doesn't mean that you're infected with them, and I know that gets confusing. It's confusing to the Western Medicine Department also. They're used to looking for infection, and that's why I can't do this test through traditional labs. Traditional labs only look for infectious bacteria. They're not going to look to see if you're out of balance. This is from Larry Smarr, who gave a TED Talk. I'll give some sources for this later. But he has Crohn's slash ulcerative colitis, 
and he's an astrophysicist. And he did some research and found on the internet that he could collect his poop, like you did, and send it away from analysis. Now he has done this over and over and over and over again for several years. He sends it off when he's sick, he sends it off when he's well. And he has an interesting comment. He says, I am trapped in a local ecological equilibrium far from home. Which means that even when he's well, he's not normal as far as the microbiome is concerned. Another term which can be confusing is leaky gut. Leaky gut means that the things that are within us that we swallow get exposed to our immune system and those neurocells that we were talking about inappropriately. The western side calls this intestinal permeability and there's a lot of research on it. They show that intestinal permeability is part of irritable bowel and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. This includes type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune disease, chronic fatigue, as well as heart disease and maybe even type 2 diabetes. So while we're talking about vocabulary, I want to talk about gluten. Celiac sprue is the disease, the autoimmune disease process that happens when we have a reaction to gluten. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a growing phenomenon and being increasingly recognized in the public. But what is gluten? Gluten's actually a protein that's in grain flour, primarily thought of as being in wheat, and that's where we've really, through agricultural engineering, amplified how much gluten is in wheat today, but it's also present in corn and other grains. There's also a misconception out there that if something's gluten-free, it's healthy. A gluten-free waffle is still a waffle, and giving your kid gluten-free cookies are still cookies. Dr. Kenneth Fine has looked at lots of people for celiac and gluten sensitivity, and it's very interesting. He finds autoimmune diseases have 62% um, microscopic colitis, or what we also call um, eosinophilic esophagitis, 69%. That is why any of you who have any of these disease processes should give gluten-free a trial. The question is, what's a trial? It really takes 10 to 12 weeks of being gluten-free, kind of like a religion, meaning you're not going to mess it up, to really know. Too many people give it up for a week or two and they feel, ah, oh, I don't feel any different, and they go back to it and feel like they've given it a trial. That's not long enough to know. FODMAPS is another diet that's catching public attention. Fructo oligo dimono oligo saccharides are kind of what the FODMAP stands for. And here's a list of what they what is in that diet. Certain bacteria, when you eat FODMAPs, take those foods and ferment them. And they produce gas, they produce bloating, and they can create a lot of intestinal discomfort. So sometimes going gluten-free, you still notice, oh, I'm still having a lot of the same symptoms. And sometimes it's not really gluten, it's the simple sugars that are present in the foods. We have a copy of the FODMAP diet if we think that's something you might need to do. Have you heard of Otto Brewery Syndrome? Did you know you could actually make beer and alcohol in your gut? If you're growing the right type of yeast, and you have the right type of bacteria, and you eat simple sugars of any kind, you can actually become drunk. It's been used successfully as a DUI defense even here in the state of Florida. It caught public attention last fall when a guy went into an ER and blew like a .3 without having drunk anything. So, you know, all the late night TV shows were making fun of it. But usually in every class we have at least one person who is an auto brewer. What's your backdoor way of knowing that this might be you? If you eat the simple sugars and it kind of makes you a little drunk, you know, where you slur your words and you kind of crash right afterwards, you might be our auto brewer in this class. What about yeast? That's another thing that's been in the public eye for a couple decades now. Um, Dr. Oz recently focused on it on his television show. And yeast is a very interesting colonizer of our yard. It can release some of those chemicals I talked about earlier that feed back to the brain and make you want to eat those simple sugars. That's because yeast can only use simple sugars to survive. And the more the yeast dies, the more that chemical comes out and the stronger those cravings become for those simple sugars. There are natural ways of getting rid of it as well as pharmaceutical. I tend to like to blend the two because the pharmaceutical is a little harsh and the natural takes a really long time and a very strong willpower. 
H. pylori, if you had this, we had you come in separately. It's a bad bug. We find it as a root cause in a lot of really bad things, from cancer to cardiovascular disease. It's kind of like strep throat. It's contagious, and you can get it more than once. But not everybody in a family gets it when somebody has it. Just because this test is negative, if you start to have the symptoms of H. pylori, the burning, the reflux, it's worth getting it tested again, and we can do that through a traditional lab. Unfortunately, you have to collect some poop for us. What about parasites? Again, that's something that we would typically have you come in and we would discuss separately. Nobody likes finding out that they have worms in front of a lot of other people. The test itself scans for the typical North American parasites, including you know, some in South and Central America, but not as extensive. If you're somebody who grew up in Guam or India and you have parasite not identified on the lab report, there's a chance we probably might want to treat you anyways. A little bit back to some of the research about vaginal versus cesarean delivery. If you were born cesarean or have had a cesarean delivery, you don't have as good of a microbiome. Fortunately, with the probiotics we have available to us today, we can fix that. And what about all those hand sanitizers everywhere and keeping our kids clean? It actually isn't a great idea. The bacteria that we're exposed to in our environment are actually good for us for the most part. We're not talking about the infectious bacteria, those we want to stay away from. And we really need to let our kids play in the dirt a little bit, though I don't know about kissing pigs. What about the research in pediatrics? There's some outstanding research showing that probiotics help with colds and flu, diarrhea, um, atopy, otherwise known as eczema, asthma, and those types of diseases. There's also some great research in females showing that those of us who get recurrent UTIs or bacterial vaginosis or vaginal yeast infections will benefit tremendously from the right probiotic. So what is the right probiotic? It's very confusing and there's a lot of consumerism going on. First, I want to point out that there are some societies that have probiotic quality statements and we have one printed off for you. But here in the state of Florida, if you think about bacteria, if we heat them up too much, they become cooked and they die. And so a lot of the over-the-counter probiotics are just that, they're dead. They rode on the back of an 18-wheeler that stopped at a rest area and got a little bit on the hot side. That's why the probiotics we carry are shipped to us on dry ice and the ones at the health food store are typically kept in the refrigerator when they're of higher quality. It's not that when you get home, they need to be refrigerated, so to speak. We're 98.4. We're certainly not a refrigerator and the bacteria can grow in us. But we can't get too hot or they can't get too hot and survive. Quantity is also important. It should be in the billions, ideally at least 5 to 10 billion in a capsule. The strains are important too. As I've been talking, there's different research in different strains of bacteria that do different things. In fact, this is the number one topic for PhD research right now in the biological sciences. And what about prebiotics? They're somewhat important. If they're in the capsule with the probiotics, it helps with shelf life. But we also need to be feeding ourselves prebiotics as well to keep our flora healthy. The prebiotics are inulin and chicory and other forms of fiber. So how do we get to a healthy microbiome? First, we have to identify the initiators, like food allergies, bad bacteria, the dysbiosis. That's one of the reasons for this test. And then we remove those offending agents. We also replace and restore proper digestion. And then we're going to re-inoculate with the right bacteria. Finally, we're going to regenerate the intestinal lining and fix the leaky gut. And we're going to work on rebalancing us. Remember how I talked about the bacteria can secrete peptides and things that affect our mood and other things in our body? The same thing goes for our mood affecting them. When we're under a lot of stress and depression, the shifts in our ecology and our body go along with it. It's kind of a bad cycle. There's one product I want to talk about for fixing the leaky gut that has some outstanding research. 
they took some college kids and gave them non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. That's like ibuprofen and Aleve. And they measured zonulin, which is a marker of intestinal permeability. The ones they gave a placebo to had increased zonulin in their bloodstream, which indicates that the permeability is there. The ones they gave zinc carnosine, though, did not. So if you're somebody who takes non-steroidal anti-inflammatories on a regular basis, or really anytime you're taking antibiotics, zinc carnosine should be something you take for a while after you finish to help heal the gut back up. Sometimes I get asked about measuring zonulin. I can't do that right now outside of a research laboratory. There's a few talks if you're interested in learning more about this. Ted Med has Larry Smarr's talk, very interesting. It's about 17 minutes long. And then Mind Altering Microbes, How the Microbiome Affects the Brain by Emily, and I'm not going to try her last name, at Caltech. And then finally, Jonathan Eiler does Mind Your Microbes, and that's a fantastic talk, not just about the bacteria within us, but also the ones that live on us. And that's a whole other story. Now, let's talk about your results. Thank you for listening.